I'm Alan Wegner. I'm part of the design team and I'm the lead for it. Yep. And then uh, I'm Ryder. I'm the electromechanical lead. And uh, this is Team 930, and Team 930 has been building robots for about 20 years. So we wanted to share just an introduction to pneumatics, but also what does our team do. So we're going to start by looking at what are pneumatics. We're going to talk about how we design them, and then also how they're mapped kind of on the robot. Talk about air tanks and cylinders, valve and switches, solenoid valves, and manifolds. We'll talk about managing our pneumatics, and then we'll also look at some pneumatics in action. Starting with what are pneumatics? So the word pneumatics is from the Greek word meaning winder, winder air. The formal definition is uh, using technology and using compressed gas to create movement. 99% of the time that is going to be linear, and that's all you are going to see in first robotics. Uh, you do have a bunch of other components involved, including electrical and also compressors and whatnot. So next, how is it measured? Pneumatics are measured with two main values, flow and pressure. So flow is the total volume of gas per amount of time. So it tells you the speed of your gas. Uh, and the main way that you can change it is basically the size of whatever orifice you're going through. Uh, it's measured mostly in feet cubed per minute or gallons per minute. And then pressure is the total force that the gas exerts. It's measured in pounds per square inch. Um, and it's determined by how long you run your compressor or what you, the value your regulator is set to. The main way we measure this is using the regulator, which you can see right here. Uh, so the main difference between pressure and flow, you can see over here. So if we have this constant pressure source, but by changing the size of whatever it passes through, we can change the flow. So next is pneumatics versus hydraulics. Uh, starting with pneumatics, pneumatics use gas which is usually an inert gas, but also sometimes is air, which is what we use in FRC, uh, just standard air. Um, it's pneumatics get, allow you to have quick, but quick force, but it's not as going to be as strong as hydraulics. Uh, after each use, your pneumatics so you release gas into the atmosphere, so uh, you have to repressurize, whereas in hydraulics you do not. Hydraulics give you a slow but very powerful force, um, but are very messy if there's a leak or anything. And it's for that reason why we do not see that in first robotics. So let's talk about how we use first, or how we use pneumatics in first. So um, in first, uh, we convert that linear motion oftentimes into rotational motion. For instance, we have our pneumatic cylinder right here. And allows us to bring our intake in and also bring it out and it kind of creates a rotational motion. So using different mechanical properties you can change how the linear motion is uh, outputted. So the next thing we're going to look at is how we design pneumatics. Uh, the main way that we design tubing is we don't actually have all the tubing length but what we can do right here if we see in this picture is we add this um, just starting of where the pneumatic tubing comes from. And that allows us to make sure that we're not interfering with anything else or with running train and whatnot. And that's as far as we go with tubing. With cylinders, uh, in order to dimension them and determine dimensions, we have two main dimensions that we use with cylinders. Uh, we have our extension dimension, which you can see with this uh, tan line here, and then we have our retracted dimension. Uh, and this was a scenario where we were looking at using three different types, three different lengths of pistons, and we were able to determine where the different hole patterns would be in this particular mechanism, which is the claw up here. As far as how other components are put on, um, we usually just take the CAD and put it somewhere on the robot, and that allows us to make sure that we have space for our pneumatics. Um, and also maybe adding pull, pull mounting for them. But as, that's as far as we go for desi designing them. All right, so um, mapping pneumatics. Um, we're just gonna go over a few um, main components of it, um, mostly through the airflow. Um, electronics, we'll talk about them a little bit later. And we'll go to the next one. Um, so it starts at the compressor. The compressor does exactly as it is named. Um, compresses air 
Um, this compressor is directly wired to your pneumatic hub, which is down in the bottom left. Um, the pneumatic hub is kind of like the brains of pneumatics in the robot. Um, that's kind of your center for electronics. Um, the pneumatic hub offers all the ports for your single acting and double acting um, solenoids and, and uh, cylinders. Uh, it also needs power just like any other electrical component, um, receiving the power from the PDH. Um, the pneumatic hub is also required to be in the canvas, and all this adds up to be that brain of pneumatics that I referred to as earlier. Um, so once the air is compressed, it then moves down or moves into the uh, pressure relief valve. This is kind of like the safety net of pneumatics. So the pressure relief valve prevents the compressor from pulling too much air and makes sort of a popping noise as it releases air when it's over compressed. The compressed air should then enter through the uh, storage tanks there. Um, these tanks can hold up to 120 PSI legally. And I guess that we left our box on, so I'm gonna turn that off real quick. But um, as the air continues through the system, the air encounters the pressure switch. Um, the pressure switch is the component that detects the pressure and decides whether or not to turn off the compressor. Um, the pressure switch will activate um, being at a set pressure of 120 PSI or less legally. Um, this output is uh, stored on, or put onto the stored pressure gauge. Um, the stored pressure gauge should be connected to the pneumatic vent plug, um, the area in which the air can be released manually on your robot, um, which is required to be legal. Um, while the stored air is obtained, the working pressure also builds up. Working pressure is the amount of air that can be used in a given area on your robot. The working pressure is controlled by regulators, keeping the pressure legally at 60 PSI or lower. Um, once the air has gone through all these components, it can then be sent out to your solenoids and or cylinders. All right, let's look at air tanks and pistons. So first, what are air tanks? Air tanks are... Um, what you use to store your compressed air. So the more air tanks you have, the more times you're going to be able to use air. However, it also means the longer time it will take to compress. Um, this is the standard um, air tank that you'll see in FRC. Um, what we do on it as a team is we print these mounts for it, um, and they allow us to very easily attach it to the robot. The main way that you can use air tanks strategically is by using devoted air tanks. And devoted air tanks, how we use that is we use something called a check valve, which allows us to only use um, air tanks for one specific component on your robot. So for instance, in our uh, prototype of robot this year, we had a catapult and we had an intake. And those are running mostly during the match, and that was used at most of our air. But at the end of the match, we had our end game, which would allow us to climb, which needed air pressure. So what we did is we used these two tanks here and we used check valves to make sure that the air from those air tanks could not go to the uh, intake or the catapult throughout the match, that we always had air for end game. So let's look at what cylinders are. So cylinders um, is what is actually converting your compressed air into movement. And there's two main types that we um, see in FRC. Those are double acting and single acting cylinders. Double acting cylinders um, have two air inlet valves. One air inlet is for pushing the piston forward, and one air inlet valve is for pushing it backwards. A single acting cylinder only has one air inlet valve, um, and this means that uh, it has a spring that pushes it back the other way. Um, so the difference is really, it, single acting is more simple, but a double acting will give you a lot more reliability. That's why we tend to use those in our robot. Uh, the main way Cylinders differ is between their stroke, pore size, and rod diameter. So first thing is stroke, and stroke is the difference between the um, cylinder's extended length and retracted length. Um, this is how far the piston is going to extend. Um, if you have a larger stroke, that means you're also going to have a larger piston, and then you're going to use more air on your robot. Um, the next thing is bore size, and bore size is this inner diameter of the piston. Um, a, Larger inner diameter means that you will also have a larger cross-sectional area, which you can see in that image over there. Cross-sectional area will tell you how powerful your piston is going to be. The larger cross-sectional area, the more force you have. So that means um, actually on the extend mode, when you extend your piston, it's stronger than your retract mode. Because if you look in that image, the rod takes up part of the surface area on the 
uh, retract them up. Um, the final thing is rod diameter. And rod diameter, um, a larger rod diameter will mean that your piston is going to be a lot stronger and it will prevent it against it bending. Pistons are very strong in the direction of, that they push, but they are very weak in, if you're perpendicular to that. So you can see in this image right here, this piston bent, bent completely. If a piston is bent in any way, it cannot be used anymore because it cannot be retracted or extended. All right, uh, valves, regulators, and switches. Um, we're going to go through a few more valves and switches that we didn't talk about earlier on. One with talking about some examples of regulators and how we use them to our advantage. Um, starting with check valves. Obviously, we talked about check valves and how we use those for our end game system. Um, those, another common use for that is coming out of your compressor. Um, flow control valves, which are um, connectors that are screwed directly into the cylinder. Um, they're used to control the amount of air that a pneumatic component receives. Um, controlling this air allows the user to have some control of the speed of the air going into the cylinders. Um, then we have regulators. Regulators are useful for controlling airflow in between two tubing. Um, regulators provide a lot of use when trying to control speeds, both extending and retracting pistons. Um, the way we use regulators in our 2022 robot be in our wind, windmill end game system that we used a lot. Um, we used a lot of air to power the quads. However, we realized that um, very early on that it was too much air. Um, and we'll kind of demonstrate that later. Um, for starters, the amount of pressure that we were experiencing in the quads um, worried about the 3D prints that we have on the inside. Um, these 3D prints um, are decently fragile. Um, and when we slam those closed to clamp around the rungs on the um, climbing system, um, would they, they were probably bound to cause issues. Um, but it was good to be precautionary by using these um, regulators in order to balance it out. Um, the other reason was due to our catapult. Um, a lot of air was being used in the catapult and having a tank for cylinder, um, which resulted in us trying to conserve as much air as possible. Um, as a result, we lowered the amount of air going into the end game, um, also using regulators on our intake. Um, one being our extending and one being our retracting to control the intake speeds both that way. And yeah. Let's talk about solenoid valves and manifold. So a solenoid valve has two parts. It's the electrical solenoid and the mechanical valve. The electrical solenoid is what takes the electrical input, and the valve is what allows air, compressed air to either go through the tube or not go through the tube. Uh, we have two main types of solenoids, and those are double acting and single acting, much similar to a single acting and double acting piston. And the idea is the same. With the single acting, you have um, one way to open the valve, and then you have a passive spring to close the valve. So its default position is always when the, string, the spring is extended. Uh, so that means whenever the robot is turned off, it will always return to that state. However, a double acting solenoid allows you to move the valve in either direction. Uh, and this means that whatever valve, uh, point where the valve is put at, when the robot is turned off, the valve will stay in that position. Um, the uh, main way you're going to want to use each of the other is an example with our climber again. So at the end of the match, uh, if for instance if we had climbed all the way up and then the robot turned off, if we had set the single solenoid to the wrong value, then it could cause the entire robot to collapse. Um, however, with a double acting solenoid, it allows us to stay at the current position. So that way the cylinders do not do anything after the end of the match. Uh, solenoids also have different flow speeds. Uh, so that's basically the size that the size of the valve that the air is allowed to go through. So for instance, on our catapult right here, we use larger solenoids that allow for more flow to allow us to have a faster catapult. Um, so there's two main ways you can put a solenoid on a robot, and that is either just having a single solenoid or using a manifold. A, a manifold is basically a block that allows you to put multiple solenoids on um, in one spot. Um, it allows to everything to be very compact. Um, so an example of this is we use this mostly for intake or um, basically anything in general. However, um, cases where we use 
single cell lines include the down end game, um, where it allowed us to have where we could just put a single solenoid there, and it would um, not have big black off of it. And we also didn't have to run a lot of tubing upwards because we had the solenoids up in our end game. Um, the reason we used single solenoids on our catapult was because it allowed us to directly attach our solenoids to our pistons. And when you do that, it also allows for faster speed. Uh, and it also allowed us to be able to put those larger solenoids on. Right. Um, managing the max. Um, the max can get messy pretty easily. Um, it's a lot of tubing, a lot of uh, obviously wiring with the solenoids and all that. Um, and I believe that tends to scare teams away from using or underutilizing pneumatics to their advantage. Um, some tips that we had to offer include a lot of attention when cutting and plugging. Um, the easiest way to avoid leak in tubing is by making sure that it's done right the first time. Um, cutting tubing straight is a great start. Um, using the right tool for the right job is always important. And uh, these are the um, cutters that we use. Um, they're just the Nitra TC12 that you can order off of uh, many pneumatic sites wherever you guys uh, buy your pneumatics from. Um, <laughs> apparently the matches start with hearing this. Um, they're cheap and efficient. Um, avoiding using scissors, side cutters, or other cutting tools um, are very important because it just, I mean, it ensures that your tubing isn't going to have problems because when it's not cut straight, you can have leaks even internally that sometimes you might not even be able to hear. Um, another tip when running your tubing would be make sure that your tubes are always plugged in correctly um, and taking the time to make sure that plugs are connected and not having to look for leaks later on. Um, tug test is just always the easiest, just pulling in the, the tube and making sure that it's not going to slide out. Um, obviously, if it slides out, then either the connector is bad or um, the tube wasn't plugged in all the way. Like I said, this is also a good way to determine if the connector itself is bad, um, which can happen with many different reasons. Also, we're routing tubing. Another thing to consider is your bend radius. Um, when tubing bends, uh, the hole through which the air flows becomes smaller, um, which is going to slow down your speed or slow down how much or not allow as much air as you want into that specific pneumatic component. Um, this can cause a lot of flow issues. Um, another good habit to get into is labeling. Um, labeling helps a lot when you have complicated systems with tons of tubing routing to central places. Um, an example we have is in our 2022 end game. As you guys can see here, all these blue tubing um, are kind of routed to one central spot where that breaks off and then goes into the separate sides of the arms, which again has just a ton of tubing. Um, just labeling the ends is a is a um, is a big thing. Just labeling where or where it's supposed to plug into. Um, another thing is uh, labeling the or labeling in the form of color coding. Um, so 930 has three different colors here. Um, we use blue as kind of like our central routing. So we have one blue tube that runs up the side and into our end game, um, which then breaks off into these tubes here that kind of distribute the air amongst the rest of the arms. Um, yellow being the extend part of our um, pneumatics, and then black being the retract. Um, like I said, helps with efficiency when plugging in. Um, we've had to redo our entire end game system, I think, three times in terms of pneumatic plugging. So um, by having those color coding, it just makes it a lot easier to go off and, and plug them all in the correct spots. Um, small leaks can also, also be um, unnoticeable until they become larger. Um, usually at a more inconvenient time. A way to find small leaks is going around with soapy water. Um, putting a small round of water around the connection will cause bubbles to pop up and then you'll know if that's the leak that you're looking for. Um, the soapy water, yeah, I said that. Another uh, post routing maintenance check that can uh, be used is analog pressure switch. Using the analog pressure switch that plugs directly into the rotor Rio, um, you can receive outputs on voltages being used and um, this should be checked often as too high or too low voltages can indicate issues in the electronic parts of pneumatics. Um, and yeah. Um, so pneumatics in action. Um, so we've got our two components here that we talked about a bunch here. Um, we're just gonna kind of go over it. Um, this being our catapult system. So obviously the catapult here, we have four cylinders hooked up um, to four separate solenoids. Um, all these cylinders had individual tanks running to them. 
um, to ensure that we have the correct amount of air to launch the ball. So we used the catapult for our week one event in Duluth. Um, it didn't prove too efficient because pneumatics can be slow sometimes in comparison to like a two wheel shooter, but um, it did what we wanted to in the fact that it kept the balls shooting at a consistent uh, height and speed. And then, yeah. So um, you can kind of mess around with this here. We'll turn that on. So if I hold down here, press this button. So as you can see, um, all these pistons are hooked up into one uh, aluminum bracket that are then pushing up on this all in one. Um, and using that can add to your force and add to your speed. I don't know if you have any of that on there. Yeah, the main reason we used these four cylinders was to allow us to have um, enough power with the four cylinders, but also have enough speed with using this smaller board. So we didn't have to have, you just have to fill as much air as quickly, and therefore it can extend a lot faster. Um, and then, Dan, you want to talk about the arm or whatever? Yeah. So our arm here and our climber um, uses um, pistons to extend forward, and it basically creates this rotational motion and closes the claw. Uh, and we use this actual uh, this metal sensor, and it detects when there's metal, and then that way it knows when to close the claw. So, um, for our, we okay, so, if I hold this up here, go ahead and whenever you're ready, and then when he releases, the pneumatics pull back pretty quickly. Um, did you talk about the over-center locks? Yeah, so, the, when the pneumatics are extended, it uses an over-center mechanical connection and it creates it so that if this is always pushed forward, it's almost impossible to allow the claws to be extended backwards. Watch yourself. Watch yourself there. Um, but yeah, and we can go to the next slide. So um, in the course of the workshop here, um, we talked about general pneumatics, kind of the specific parts of it, um, what they do, how to use them to your advantage, um, talked a little bit more in depth about managing all these, and then um, showing our 2022 um, use of pneumatics. Um, ultimately, pneumatics is something to um, use to your team's advantage. Um, it can complement great mechanisms on robots. Um, we hope this presentation was useful to you guys, um, both for the experience and inexperience um, that attended. If you guys have any questions, I mean, feel free to ask. And um, we can, at the end, I mean, once questions start to slow down, if you guys want to come up and play around with either components, we can do that too. Um, thank you guys all for listening and for your great attention. Um.